Americans love using their credit cards, the most secure and hassle-free way to pay. But DC politicians want to change that with the Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill. This bill lets corporate megastores pick how your credit card is processed, allowing them to use untested payment networks that jeopardize your data security and rewards. Corporate megastores will make more money, and you pay the price. Tell Congress to guard your card, because Americans lose when politicians choose. Learn more at GuardYourCard.com. To the G5 Hive Live, we are excited to bring you the G5 college football coverage you love each and every week. I am Luke. Always get my fingers mixed up. I am uh, joined by my co-host, Justice. If you're watching us on YouTube, please hit that like and subscribe button. And if you're like Eric Froton, who got here early, actually right on time, we just started a little bit late, thanks to me. Um, uh, make sure you go out and you comment. We'll try to get to everybody's comments as the show goes on. If you have something, please ask. Uh, we'll get it out there. Um, and if you're watching us on X, please give us a follow, a like, a retweet. If you're listening to us in podcast form, please rate and review. Justin and I have some big news. We talked about it a little bit last week, but uh, it is a pinned tweet on our uh, X Justice, do you want to talk a little bit about this before we kind of get into the the nuts and bolts? Sure. Of- yeah. I mean, um, so it, our merch store is now available live. I will put the link in the comments. Um, I literally just got the word probably five minutes ago from the uh, the provider that um, that it's available. Um, so yeah, if you want to support us, the best ways to support the work that we do here is number one, go to YouTube, hit that subscribe button, and number two, visit the merch store, get yourself some uh, some uh, sweet gear. Uh, we got shirts, long sleeve, short sleeve, uh, performance shirts, uh, fleeces, hoodies, all the above. Um, so yeah, uh, visit the, uh, the merch store. The link is in the video comments on YouTube. It's also pinned to our... Uh, to our um, Twitter page, X page, whatever you want to call it. So twin, it's it's pinned to the top there, so you can find the link there. So yeah, um, super excited about that. We don't have hats yet. Um, the the hats that uh, Luke and Higher Order were kind of a one off kind of thing. Um, if there's a demand for hats, we can I can talk to the hat guy. The hat guy is a different provider than to get the shirt guy. Um, but you gotta we have, have, we have you gotta have a you gotta have a hat guy, you gotta have a shirt guy, and as uh uh Chris Carter always mentioned, gotta have a fall guy. Gotta have those three. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But yeah, well, Justice, big, big it was, news, man. And I don't know, maybe bigger news, not sure where where you stand on it, but ODU, it's been a while since there's been a home game. You're a season yeah, ticket holder. Month. You gotta go, you gotta go to to the game, and uh, you're rewarded with a win. Yeah, it's it's been a month since a home game. Um, I have media rights to Old Dominion football, so I, I get to go to the the press conference. Um, I haven't used it to go on the field yet because, like, I don't have a super nice camera, and I don't want to sit there and look like I'm taking pictures with my cell phone and all these folks out there taking pictures with their nice camera. So. I just kind of sit in my season tickets and then I go to the, the post game press conference, man. But 
what a game. I, I don't know if, if folks watched that game, but, I mean, they held – the defense played phenomenal. They held uh, Texas State scoreless in the first quarter, in the first half. It's 14 to nothing at halftime. Um, they just really – I mean, they played really well. They got after uh, Jordan McLeod, kind of held the receivers down. The, the one guy, man – so, I, you know, we interviewed Ismail Mahdi back, I don't know, January, February time frame. Um, I got to see him in person, and my God, he, he's good. He's good. Um, he, he ran, I think, for like 145 yards. He was he was, he was, was getting like, it seemed like, six to ten yards a carry. Um, and almost every time we were stopping him with like a shoestring tackle. And I, and I told my friend, like, you know, in the first quarter, I was like, man, that's that can't that's not gonna continue, right? He's gonna break one of these. Cause like how often can you can you just keep shoestring tackling the guy? Well, they kept doing it throughout the game. Um, I don't think it's a great recipe for success in the future, but it worked on Saturday. Um, but yeah, Is Ismadi was man, he was impressive to see in person. But yeah, old Dominion got the win. Um, and then pretty pretty special because it, it brings up a huge game Thursday night. The game is on national TV, ESPN2 versus Georgia Southern. Georgia Southern is undefeated in Sunbelt play, number one in the Sunbelt East. Um, Old Dominion is in second in the Sunbelt East with a couple other teams. So if Old Dominion can get that win, um, they'll be tied for first. Uh, and they'll have the tiebreaker over Georgia Southern. It's Military Appreciation Week. Uh, the coaches show tonight was done in a submarine. The USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, um, which is pretty cool, right? Um, and then this past week, they unveiled some pretty sweet new uniforms uh, for homecoming. They were Hudson Blue, as ODU calls it, with the old retro racetrack logo, a white helmet with the Hudson Blue ODU racetrack logo and Hudson Blue stripes. I don't know. Just a cool week, man. And and, and a bit huge game Thursday night um, coming up. So, yeah, could, couldn't. it's a good time to be an Old Dominion fan, hopefully. Uh, we can uh, we can knock off the Eagles on Thursday night. The if you didn't watch that game, um, there was a point in the game where o ODU was up by three, and I think there was like a minute fifty nine left, and it was fourth and two. ODU had the ball on their own, I don't know, thirty yard line or so, and the decision was kick the field goal, go up six, or go for it. Um, they took a timeout. I, I told my dad, I said. Ricky Ronnie's going to kick the field goal. He's just so conservative. That's what he's going to do. Um, he didn't. They went for it. They got it. Colton Joseph got another touchdown to put the score, put them up by even more. But in, in the post-game press conference, someone asked Ricky about that about that call. And, um, and he said, you know, to my own detriment, and my agent's not going to like this, uh, but I want to be honest with you guys, I was going to kick the field goal. And I just kind of started laughing to myself a little bit because I was like, yeah, I know you were. Um, and they, they talked, he talked through that, talked it through. Some of these folks were definitely in his ear, I would assume. He didn't say who, who but he kind of said, well, you know, that only puts us up six. Touchdown still beats us. Uh, you know, I figured, you know, Kenny's going to, you know, go for the touchdown. And so, and I, you know, even if, even if we were only up three, he's not going to kick that field goal. He goes, I wanted to be up more than three. And uh, so that's ultimately why we why they went for it. Um, yeah, I don't. It wasn't, but it, I guess the funny thing for me was it was I wasn't shocking to hear him say um, I was going to kick the field goal. But you know, ultimately, other other folks were able to get to him, and they were, in my opinion, they were right. You know, what's the difference between three and six? Not a whole lot. Um, and uh, Colton Joseph got a touchdown. They win by ten. So that's, that's like the first time they've won by more than one score. In a really, really long time. <laughs> but, yeah, it, it was a great game. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, excited for Thursday. All right. Well, you also got to ask your first question in the post-conference or the, the post-game yeah, press conference. I did. I did. So, uh, for the first time this year, there were different players. So, every other home game, the two players that they brought in, after Coach Ronnie were Aaron Young running back and Koa Nawataloa uh, linebacker. So that's the only players we had seen in the post-game press conference. This time they had Colton Joseph, 
the the redshirt freshman quarterback. They had Jerron Manning, the safety, and Marcus Knight, linebacker. And uh, Jerron, I've been a big fan of Jerron Manning. He's um, he's one of the best safeties in college football. If you know, much less just a G five. Um, we we do we do some uh, we do our twenty twenty players each week. Jerron Manning is the number one safety on that, and he's not just the number one safety in the G five and adjusted net yards. He's the number one safety in all of college football. Um, he does. He tackles. He covers. He does it all. I just hope that uh, Old Dominion can um, can hold on to Jerron Manning. Um, he he seems to really love it here, um, and, and hopefully that will go a long way at the end of the year. Because there's no doubt in my mind that uh, some big schools with some big money are going to come calling for Jerron Manning. But nonetheless, yeah. So he, Jerron Manning was one of the players, and um, I asked him a question just about his mentality and coverage. You know. Folks always talk about how well he tackles. He led the team in tackles, 14 tackles. He's great in run support. But folks don't, don't understand how great he is in coverage as well. So I asked him, a, you know, a question about his mentality and coverage and basically said, you know, it's just it's a, it's a me versus them thing. And, you know, I'm going to win. I want to be the winner. Uh, and so it's just that that's kind of what it is. Um, but, yeah, that was the first question I asked in the um, in the press conference. So that was cool. And it was to Jerron Manning. Um, and hopefully, uh, yep. Hopefully, one day in the near future, uh, we'll have Jerron on for an interview. But yeah, good stuff. All right. Yes, Billy. Thursday night, ESPN two, seven p.m. The game's at Old Dominion. Like I said, Military Appreciation Week. They're you know doing this whole drone show at halftime. No idea if the drone show is going to be on television or not, but just just great stuff. All right, well, let's get into the G5 Hive Players of the Week for Week 8. Uh, freshman Offensive Player of the Week is wide receiver TJ Pratt at New Mexico State. TJ caught four balls for 59 yards and a touchdown to lead the Aggies in a double overtime, 33-30 to 30 victory over Louisiana Tech. In high school, TJ competed in track and field in addition to football. As a senior at DeSoto High School, he got 54 passes for 988 yards and 13 touchdowns in the Texas 6A D2 State Championship when TJ caught eight balls for 112 yards and one touchdown. Congratulations, uh, TJ. Our freshman defensive player of the week is linebacker Chris Jones from Southern Mississippi. Chris had nine tackles, six solos, half a tackle for a loss to lead the Golden Eagles defense in Week 8. Chris was a three-star athlete and top 65 player in Mississippi by 24-7 when he was coming out of high school. He played for Hartfield Academy and led them to their first undefeated season in a Class 6A state championship. He was also named the Class 6A Defensive Player of the Year and to the Army All-American Bowl. As a senior, he tallied 112 tackles, 20 tackles for loss, five sacks, four interceptions, four quarterback hurries, and seven touchdowns. Congratulations, Chris Jones, on being the G5 Hive Freshman Defensive Player of the Week. All right. And getting into my Offensive Player of the Week, I had a couple different options I was leaning, but ultimately I go friend of the program, Mario Anderson out of Memphis. He played a huge role in the Tigers' 52-44 to win over North Texas. He had 22 carries for 100 and, or 183 yards rushing, four touchdowns. He had five receptions for 27 yards. With how Army and Navy are playing, this was a big win to stay in the hunt for the conference championship appearance. And ultimately, that's why I picked, picked him in this one. It was this back and forth, and they needed all four touchdowns that he was able to provide. Uh, North Texas, it was a good back and forth game. A little defense played. But, yeah, all four touchdowns were huge. And it's like, you know, if they would have lost that game and get two losses, then, like, yeah, they're probably hey, I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know how you're making that up here um, as the season, as we're getting late into the season. So that's ultimately why I picked Mario Anderson. Other, other people had great games, but he had a great game, and it was important. For my Offensive Player of the Week, I went with running back A.J. Turner from the – Turner from the Marshall Thundering Herd. AJ has been electrifying all season on limited touches and definitely the but he's definitely the best running back for the Thundering Herd. In week 8, AJ had 15 carries for 177 yards rushing. That's 11.8 yards per carry. He had three rushing touchdowns and he added one catch for 30 yards and another touchdown through the air. 
to lead the Thundering Herd to victory over Georgia State in Week 8. Congratulations, AJ. For my Defensive Player of the Week, I went back to New Mexico State with defensive end Cale Edwards. Cale is a senior defensive end for the New Mexico State Aggies, had seven tackles, five solos, and four sacks in the Week 8 win over Louisiana Tech. The Aggies won in double overtime, 33-30. Congratulations, Cale. All right, and my defensive player of the week, I took uh, linebacker Malachi Langley out of Fresno State. Langley had 13 tackles, seven of which, of which were solos. He had a two sacks in their 24-21 to 21 win over Nevada. Now, Justice, let's get into what the Swarm needs to know. What are the news and notes from Week 8 around the G5? All right, uh, a lot of things happening, especially in like the last, I don't know, two days. Uh, but yeah. last week, last week, Hawaii announced they're joining the Mountain West as an all sports member in 2026. Uh, previously, they were fo football only. I believe they were in the Big Sky, I want to say, or Big West uh, for other sports. Uh, but they're going to join the Mountain West full time. It gives the Mountain West the eight full time members that are required. Um, and then, so now the Mountain West is kind of turning their sights into a football-only school, and uh, reportedly they're targeting Northern Illinois and Toledo to join as football-only. Um, I don't. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I don't. I don't. I because what would they do with their other sports? Um, just just seeing how conference things work in the, uh, you know in the past, when you tell them you're leaving football. I think they generally would say, hey, well, you're not welcome here in the other sports either. Um, and so I would think especially if they're going to. Like especially like with like the MAC bringing in teams here, like they wouldn't. I would think that they wouldn't want to lose teams because you just brought on. Team, like, I don't know, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. And so I don't I don't know how enticing a football only invite is for a MAC school. I would think they would, you know, for them it would have to be um, all sports, and I just don't know. Like, they, do they want that more the additional travel? Um, I don't know. Just kind of interesting, interesting, um, interesting dynamics. I, I agree with you, Billy. Leave the Mac alone. I think they're 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 adding UMass next year. I think they're perfect as is. Um, but at the end of the day, some of these teams or schools have bigger aspirations. I just don't know that the the Mountain West does something more for a team in the MAC than the MAC does for them, right? It's not like they're joining um, the Big Ten or the Big Twelve or something like that. Um, they're at the end of the day, it's all uh, still G five. All right. Uh, so moving on to some of the bigger news that started happening yesterday, we saw East Carolina fire head coach Mike Houston. Uh, they named defensive coordinator Blake Harrell as the interim head coach. Houston was 27 and 38 in five plus seasons, um, 15 28 in the conference, and five and 14 the past two seasons. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that's come as a huge surprise. East Carolina, from my understanding, was a pretty big spender uh, in NIL this offseason. And yeah, obviously, they're not getting the results on the field. Um, they look better than they did last year, but that's not that's not hard to do last year. They were they were god awful, um, you know. They brought in uh, Kaden Hauser, Jake Garcia, a, a lot of other uh, big time transfers. Um, so they spent a lot of money. I'm assuming they weren't getting the results that they wanted. And you know, head coach Mike Houston is the one to ha ha unfortunately have to pay that price. Um, so uh, Hero Sports kind of had a wrote an article after the firing um, and kind of talked about five potential candidates. Um, I don't know that any any one in particular stands out to me. Uh, but personally, Jacksonville personally, personally, I think this is the audition for Blake Harrell. Typically, especially in college, you, you normally see the special teams coordinator become the interim because they have kind of worked with everybody. And they have time throughout the season because they're they're focused on special teams, so they can kind of help here and there. So they just know more people. So it kind of makes sense for that special teams coach to become that interim. When you go and you make an 
OC or a DC your interim, that's when it's like, okay, there's something more strategic going on. It's it is it this uh job audition, or maybe it kind of turns into one. You look at um I'm blanking on the Donaldson over at Boise State last year. Like, hey, we gotta Spencer try Danielson. to keep or, it's Danielson. You you gotta keep some guys here, you know, who win some games. He I don't know if necessarily he was considered for that job like right away, but then it kind of formed into that. So I think, you know, that's something to be aware of. Like when, when we, when we talk about these names, I think first and foremost, I think of Blake Carroll, like this might be his, his job. So the, the candidates uh, that hero sports identified was Jacksonville Jaguars running backs, coach Jerry Mack. Um, he has experience as a head coach and a coordinator in the region. Uh, before going to the Jaguars, he was Tennessee's running backs coach from uh, 21, 2021 to 2023. He was also previously an associate head coach, offensive coordinator, and quarterbacks uh, coach at Rice. He was a head coach at North Carolina Central, wide receivers coach at South Alabama and Memphis, uh, OC and quarterback coach at Arkansas Pine Bluff, uh, passing game coordinator, wide receiver coach, Central Arkansas, et cetera. Um, I, I don't, he doesn't really have any ties to East Carolina. So that just kind of, it seems like they always go after guys with ties or other, other coaches. Um, but uh, he certainly has a resume where maybe he and, and some, you know, some experience in, in the, uh, in North Carolina area. <coughs> Next was say uh, SMU offensive coordinator, Casey Woods. Um, he's currently the offensive coordinator at SMU. Um, not sure why he would necessarily want to leave other, other than to be a head coach. Um, obviously, with SMU being in the ACC, they can offer him a substantial amount of money, more so than maybe ECU can. Uh, but obviously, he's been in the AAC where SMU was at before uh, they joined the ACC. Um, East Tennessee St State head coach Trey Lamb. Uh, he was previously the head coach at Gardner Webb. Um, again, you know, a guy that maybe wants to move up. I, I don't think that ECU will go this route uh, because they just kind of did that with, with Houston, right? Houston was the head coach at JMU back when JMU was still in the FCS. So I'm not sure that East Carolina is going to be interested in going the um, – the FCS route again. Uh, another potential candidate, and this was kind of interesting, um, Indiana defensive coordinator Bryant Haynes. Um, what's interesting is he came from JMU. He was at JMU too with, with Kurt Signetti. Uh, but his defenses have been really, really good. Um, and I'm sure with the way Indiana is playing this year, he is going to be a hot commodity uh, in, in coaching searches um, in the near future. And then uh, ULM, UL Monroe head coach Bryant Vincent. This one's interesting, too, um, because I'm just assuming ECU is just going to offer more money than UL Monroe does. They have more money and, and I would assume certainly more resources. Uh, but he has yeah. certainly taken – I mean, it, it's, it's a great – it would be a great choice because he has taken UL Monroe and turned them around uh, big time. Um, you, know, I, you know, UL Monroe wasn't expected to be – to do anything in the Sun Belt West, and they're looking like the cream of the crop of the Sun Belt West, uh, at least right now. So, uh, Brian Vincent definitely an interesting candidate, uh, so potentially for East Carolina. So, shout out to Eric Froton in the chat, um, Fantasy Points, NBC Sports. He says it's time. It was time for Houston to go. Justice, what are your thoughts? Like, I usually it, i don't know it's kind of roughly around this time we start seeing those head coaches make a change but it kind of struck me as odd that ec would make this change now now i no, mean i, I guess think... they they lost to people you know regional teams you know uh I think it was they beat old State. dominion so but yeah it's like They've lost to some of those, like, so maybe you lose. Some, they lost Liberty, lost App State. So maybe that's why it is, but I don't know. It just kind of seems weird I that think, it happened at this. Because usually, like, it's the big schools that want to get a, get ahead of it and so they can start kind of plucking their guys that they that they want. 
I, I think it's more just the history, right? He hasn't he hasn't done great the whole time there. Uh, when he first started, the history was they stunk in the beginning of the year and they turned things on at the end of the year. Um, if you remember the Holton Aylers years when Holton Aylers was the QB. I mean, that was like pretty much the only good hit that was like That was kind of what they did, right? They would like lose four in a row and then they'd win like the last five or six games, something like that. Um, and so, you know, his, his tenure there hasn't been great by any stretch of the imagination. Like I said, they, they went after they, – they were big spenders in, in the portal this year. And I think those two things combined, like my, my guess is they basically told him, hey, you buy who you want. This is what you got. This is it. Do or die time. And he didn't do it. And so he, he got the ax. That would be my guess. If you're a facilities manager at a warehouse and your HVAC system goes down, it can turn up the heat, literally. But don't sweat it. Granger has you covered. Granger offers over a million industrial grade products for all your operations, including warehouse HVAC maintenance. And even better, they offer access to experts and fast delivery, so you and your warehouse can both keep your cool. Call 1 800 Granger, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. All right. Well, there's another, uh, another fire. Another head coach. <laughs> another head coach got fired. Um, and this one, like, I think folks knew this one was coming for a long time. Um, he's been on the hot seat since last season. Um, last year, he fired, I believe, all the coordinators, which saved his job. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it didn't save him too much longer. Uh, Southern Mississippi fires head coach Will Hall. They named assistant head coach Reed Stringer as the interim head coach. Hall was 14 for 30 over four seasons. In the last two seasons, he's gone four and 15. Um, looking for potential candidates, I found uh, a couple articles from Hero Sports and the College Football Network. Um, some of the Hero Sports candidates were the same as East Carolina, uh, but some different names as well. Uh, Brian Ellis, uh, Alabama tight ends coach. Uh, Brennan Marion, UNLV offensive coordinator. That one's interesting. Again, I, I expect him to probably get uh, some bigger calls. Um in terms of maybe an OC for a uh, a power four job, but definitely interesting. Now this next one, this next one should be on anybody's list if he's willing to come back, and that's Bill Clark, uh, the former UAB head coach. Um, he cited uh, health reasons why he retired from UAB, but you know he was the head coach at UAB. UAB shut down football. He became the head coach when they brought it back. So like a dormant program. And they were super successful under his tenure when 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 they came back. And so, Bill Clark, I think, you know, Southern Miss or uh, East Carolina, they could do a lot worse than Bill Clark if he's interested in coming back. Um, he would certainly be someone on. If I was one of those schools, he would definitely be someone on, on one of my short lists. Uh, Brett Vegan, uh, Montana State head coach, very successful program uh, in the FCS level. So I think that would be a good hire as well. Um, and then these next two, this next one really, I think it's really a long shot, uh, but it was mentioned in the College Football Network article, and that was Todd Munkin, who is currently the Baltimore Ravens offensive coordinator. Um, yeah. The only reason I can think he was even mentioned is because Southern Miss is kind of where he started, right? He kind of started his coaching career. If, if he wants to be or start his head coaching career, I guess I should say, his, his kind of rise among the coaching ranks came at uh, came at Southern Miss. Um, who knows? Maybe he wants to be a head coach at a, at a college football program again. My my gut says, yeah, no, that, that he does not want yeah. to be that. Um, he's going to stay at Baltimore Ravens, um, and they're certainly going to offer him a lot of money. Um, that, that Ravens offense is humming. They're humming again tonight. They already got 41 points, so. That's probably a little bit of a long shot. And then the last one is Dirk Cotter, uh, Boise State offensive coordinator. Certainly has experience as a head coach. Uh, he was a head coach at Arizona State. He's been in the NFL as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I guess I can potentially see that. Um, but there's no Ashton Genty in Southern Miss. So, I don't know. Like, again, Bill Clark, to me, is if I was either, either East Carolina or Southern Miss, he'd definitely be at the top of my list. Uh, while we're talking about head coaches, I went and looked up uh, uh, Utah State, who fired their head coach right before the season, just to kind of see 
uh, maybe some names that were being thrown around there. Um, obviously, Nate Drilling, the interim Utah State head coach, new to the team. He was hired to be the defensive coordinator. Um, I don't know. I think he's done a good job, right? I mean, kind of thrown in the fire, so to speak. So I certainly think he, he, he has, he's a serious candidate to hold on to that job. Uh, some other names that were mentioned, once again, Brennan Marion, UNLV offensive coordinator. Uh, DeAnton Lynn, USC defensive coordinator, formerly of UCLA. Great defensive coach. Um, that would be, be a great one, I think. Uh, Jason Eck, Idaho head coach from the FCS. And then Kevin McGiven, the San Jose State wide receivers coach. Um, my gut tells me they're going to stay. They're, they're probably going to stick with Nate Trailing. He's, he's he. I think, in my opinion, he's exceeded my expectations uh, for Utah State, given all that turmoil and, and the things that kind of happened there, um, you know, just weeks before the season started. So that's kind of who the person, the person I think will probably um, – get that Utah State job. And and when I'm looking at these other names, in the event that uh, Drilling does not get the, the position, something that we really like for Utah State is this offensive scheme that they've been having. Now, if you go with Marion or, you know, McGiven or even maybe Eck to that extent, like what does that do to that offense? And it's been working and, you know, even when you have a defense, you know, as long as you don't change that offensive coordinator or at least that those concepts in that system, that'll be something I guess I'm really interested to watch. Well, speaking of offense, Coastal Carolina fires offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach Travis Trickett. Um, head coach Tim Beck will assume those duties for the rest of the season. And I don't know, like the last two weeks, I guess I would say the wheels have fallen off uh, of Coastal Carolina. Um, Ethan Vasco has looked terrible. Um, two weeks ago, Noah Kim came in. He didn't look any better. Uh, this past week, um, Vasco was terrible once again. Ethan, uh, Noah Kim came in, and uh, he looked better. Um, but, yeah, this this offense has not looked good the last few weeks. Um, just looked pretty disastrous. East Coastal Carolina was a team that was, seemed to be trending up at the beginning of the year. And now they're kind of doing the opposite. And so uh, Travis Trickett is gone. Um, getting into some player news, um, you know, some players are, are kind of now coming out uh, and, and, and entering or announcing that they're going to enter the transfer portal. Uh, UTSA running back Rocco Griffin is one of those guys uh, announced that he will be entering the portal. Uh, the same with Louisiana Tech tight end Hunter Tipton. Um, and just some player news in terms of, you know, guys playing this week, injury news is general news. Uh, Jay Savell, Wyoming head coach, said that both quarterback Evan Svoboda and fresh, redshirt freshman Caden Anderson will play at quarterback this week against Utah State. They both uh, they both played this past week. Um, I don't from just I didn't watch the game looking at the stats. Um Neither one was neither neither of them was super impressive, um, so stay tuned. I guess if if you're relying on a Wyoming quarterback, uh, James Madison running back Ayo Adeyi um, is going to redshirt and he will be back uh, next season. He has another year of eligibility uh, still available, uh, so he will be returning to the Dukes. Uh, Max Brown has uh, come back for the Charlotte 49ers uh, this past week. He uh, Led the team in rushing with 67 yards, and, and hopefully that that'll improve things for tight end Colin Weber. Uh, Max Brown, Colin Weber had a good connection before the injury. Um, Colin Weber had kind of fallen off in terms of production um, the last few weeks with all the backup quarterbacks playing, but now with Max Brown back, hopefully that Charlotte passing game, and in particular uh, Colin Weber, will see an uptick in production. Uh, moving over to some injury news, Hawaii rod receiver Pofeli Ashlock did not play this past week. Um, we tried to get some uh, information on the reason why. Uh, we haven't found a reason why he didn't play um, in terms of his availability this week. Um, hopefully we'll find out something in the next day or two um, once uh, Hawaii starts practicing. And we'll be sure to let everyone know once we hear something. Um, and then UTSA. 
UTSA has a lot of injury news come out in the, in the last couple of days. Wide receiver Devin McEwen did not play this week. His status um, in future weeks is still unknown, but he's not expected to be out for the whole season. Um, but wide receiver DeCorian Clark, uh, head coach Jeff Trailer, uh, has said that Clark is going to be out for the season after suffering a torn ACL on his left knee Saturday against Florida Atlantic. Uh, DeCorian Clark had been working his way back doing rehab on a severe tear in his right knee since 2022. Um, made his first catch Saturday and then tore the ACL on his left knee. Um, just terrible news. You hate to hear that for DeCorian Tark, uh, Clark. Just just kind of brutal injury history, man. He's, he's already missed, you know, now it'll be three seasons now. He's torn ACLs in both knees. Um, just uh, sending him uh, well wishes and positive thoughts. Um, sticking with UTSA, wide receiver DJ Allen is also out for the year after tearing his ACL in their uh, Week 7 game. Temple wide receiver Dante Wright is day-to-day and questionable for Saturday's game versus East Carolina. Uh, Sam Houston, quarterback Hunter Watson, left last week with injury. He did. He played the first half, did not come back in the second half. Uh, Jace Bowers start that, started that game, or started the second half. Um, with it being a short week, um, certainly don't expect to see Hunter Watson again this week. Uh, it's very likely going to be Jace Bauer once again for Sam Houston. Uh, speaking of Sam Houston, wide receiver Noah Smith is questionable for FIU. Um, I think I believe they're hopeful that he's going to be able to play tomorrow night against the Panthers. Jacksonville State uh, running back Anwar Lewis is questionable versus Middle Tennessee this week. And Memphis, um, you know, Mario Anderson had to carry the load last week. Thank God they had Mario Anderson, uh, but he should get some uh, relief this week as running back Brandon Thomas, kind of the goal line back, um, is expected to be back available this week uh, for the Memphis Tigers. Nevada I think, quarterback. Uh, I think uh, DeRose, DeRozier is also going to be back as well. Yeah, if not this week, probably the week after. I think, right? So, yeah. getting some getting some depth there for the Tiger uh, running back room. Nevada quarterback Brendan Lewis is questionable for their game versus Hawaii, and Florida National quarterback Keon Jenkins um, got injured in the game this past week. The backup got injured in the game, um, but reportedly. Uh, he is expected to start versus Sam Houston uh, tomorrow night. Um, Central Michigan quarterback Burt Emanuel was carted off with an ankle injury. Uh, Joey Labus, uh, their starting quarterback, was already out for the season. Uh, they turned to Tyler Jefferson um, in the absence of uh, Emanuel and Labus. Um, so stay tuned. It, it didn't look good for Burt Emanuel Jr. Um, having to be carted off the field. Uh, stay tuned to see if his availability. Uh, Florida and Atlantic. I did catch in the in the post game. Um, their head coach kind of made some comments about a dirty play of the guys at the bottom of of piles were you know kind of alligator 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 rolling on on some people and they were they were twisting. So not sure if you know I didn't see the play in particular, um, but I'm sure there's some fire to that smoke but uh yeah hopefully it doesn't mean Burt will will miss too much but we'll see what this means for at least week nine florida atlantic uh wide receiver omari hayes was a uh a, a surprise inactive did not play this past week um reportedly his uh availability um against south florida is up in the air but I think that they have a bye week this week, so hopefully um, he will uh, he'll be ready when they play South Florida in two weeks. Um, Malik Sherrod, once again missed week eight. Um, not confident that we're going to see him for Fresno State uh, in week nine versus San Jose State. So that just means uh, more uh, carries for Elijah Gilliam. Uh, Jacob Zeno, UAB quarterback, missed his third straight game. They do have a bye week uh, before they play Tulsa. So that's kind of one to pay attention to, see if this two-week stretch, if uh, Jacob Zeno can get healthy. And finally, Toledo quarterback Tucker Gleason missed week eight. Uh, 
the John Allen Richter got the start. They got the win. Um, but it does look like things are trending uh, to the positive direction for him to be out there uh, in week nine for the Toledo Rockets. All right. Uh, we, we switched the order of things a little bit um, this week. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, AP Top 25. Um, Boise State in a bye week drops two spots to number 17, which just seems ridiculous to me. They didn't play, but they dropped two spots. Um, they were 15. They are now down to number 17. Army stayed at number 23. And Navy moved up one spot to number 24. Others receiving votes. Uh, UNLV came in at number 28 with five votes. And Liberty, number 31 with one vote. Yeah, I just I don't understand the, the Boise State drop. Um, but they have a big week, a big matchup this week against UNLV. And the winner of that, uh, I have no doubt, will be ranked. Uh, if it's UNLV, they deserve to be ranked. Um, they they got another win. I don't know if you want to consider it a P4 win, but they beat Oregon State um, this week. So th- they've got the most P4 wins, regardless of whether you count that Oregon State win as a P4 win or not. Um, but UNLV definitely looks uh, – UNLV – to me, in Boise State, look like the two best teams in the G5. Speaking of the G5, uh, the Hero Sports G5 Top 25 poll. Uh, we are voters in this poll. Uh, through eight weeks, um, Boise State number one, UNLV two, Army three, Navy four, Memphis five, Tulane six, Liberty seven, Louisiana eight, Western Kentucky nine and UL Monroe 10. That is the, uh, the consensus um, in the uh, from all the voters in that hero sports poll. Um, probably the, the biggest differences for us. Uh, we have Tulane at number three. They come in at number six in the consensus poll. Um, we're a little bit higher on UL Monroe. I think we have them eight and we have, we have them in Louisiana swapped. We have UL Monroe eight and Louisiana uh, ten. Um, some others that are, that are different than bigger difference than what we have um, in our in our what we submitted our votes. Uh, we have Miami at number seventeen on this consensus poll. They come in at number twenty three, and then we have Western Michigan um, at number twenty two. They um, they are not ranked and they're not in this top twenty five consensus. A little bit surprising to me because they're they're number one in the MAC right now. They're the only undefeated uh, MAC team in terms of conference play, um, so they, I think they and, definitely deserve some love. And they'll probably go up a spot or two this next week as Western Michigan takes on uh, Kent State, and Kent State is one of the few winless teams left uh, here. We've got UTEP it gets their first win beating Florida International 30-21, to 21, uh, leaving Kennesaw State, who has Liberty on Wednesday, and then the aforementioned Kent State Golden Flashes, who have Western Michigan uh, as those only uh, winless teams there in the G5. So Western Michigan we have in there. I would assume the, the consensus might have Western Michigan in there next week after I – presume a a win there i believe it's at western michigan at waldo stadium there um undefeated teams through eight weeks we have army black knights they are it's going to be a tough one uh because their opponent has never lost ever it's a bye week so i don't know uh that'll be a tough one but uh yeah army army black knights Navy midshipmen, uh, they have number 12 Notre Dame, so that will be a tough one. And then the Liberty Flames have Kennesaw State. So we've got the undefeated versus the winless team there. So I'm interested to see how the Navy one game, that Navy game goes. Um, you know, it's just hard to prepare for a, a triple option team. We've seen Notre Dame get knocked off by NIU earlier this year. I, I I think Navy can do it. I think Navy can do it. Um, G5 bowl count. Currently, there are five G5 teams that are eligible for, for bowls, and that is 
Army, Black Knights, Navy Midshipmen, Memphis Tigers, UNLV Rebels, and the Louisiana Raging Cajuns. Hey, Eric. Uh, good, to, good to see you, man. The comments. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Thanks for the support. Eric's, right. uh, er, Eric's, Eric's one of the leaders over at the College Huddle. College Huddle, we, we are a part of the College Huddle. One of the uh, the largest uh, network of um, community based uh, or, or school podcasts, you know, and, and I don't know. There's, I don't know what the count is now. My guess is like seventy five, maybe even eighty, um, of uh, you know schools school focused podcasts. Uh, they cover both football uh, and college basketball. So if you're interested in some other schools, um, visit the College Huddle. They probably have. Uh, have your favorite schools podcast available on their in their network. All right. Come back and join us next week as we discuss what happened in week nine, as well as look forward to week 10 of the 2024 season. And as always, bring you up to date on all the latest news and happenings in the world of G5 college football. If you're watching us on YouTube, please hit that like and subscribe button. If you're watching us on X, please give us a retweet, a like, and a follow. And if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please subscribe and leave those five-star ratings and reviews. Remember, we've got our new uh, uh, merch line out there. If you want to support us, go ahead and, and make a purchase there. Uh, Justice dropped the link here in in the, the chat. Link is in the you YouTube could. comments, and it's on our – it's it's – pinned on our uh, x page all right and with that we thank you all for your support and then that until the next time we are the g55 Five. <laughs>